have experienced the Lord in your fast, that He has spoken to you, that He has led you, He has directed you, He has uh, caused something new and exciting to happen in your life. Uh, we are going to continue prayer and fasting the first three days of each month, the first Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of each month for the rest of the year. So we invite you to begin to build a habit of prayer and fasting. Now, that needs to be between you and the Lord. What is the Lord asking you to do? It is not my place to stand up here and say that that needs to look a certain way, feel a certain way, but it is between you and the Lord. And if you have not sought the Lord about what that needs to look like, then you will probably get disoriented and discouraged. I invite you to take these next days and begin to ask the Lord, Lord, how would you want me to dedicate my life in prayer and fasting for the rest of this year? In those three-day periods, how do you want me, Lord, to spend that? He may say, well, I want you to give up one meal a day. He may say, I want you to give up two meals a day. He may say, I want you to give up all meals for those three days. Just hear the Lord, follow the Lord, and do what He asks you to do. And keep in front of you what is His desire through that. Again, now, if, health-wise, if you're... If your doctor would say that that's not a wise thing, uh, we're asking you to be wise about that and discerning about that. Uh, talk with your doctor, okay, and, and make sure that you're doing the, the right thing as well. So continual, we're going to be continuing this idea of prayer and fasting every month uh, for the rest of this year, and we just want to encourage you to participate in that. Part of prayer and fasting is discipline. Say the word discipline with me. Paul challenges us that we are to be disciplined in the Lord. To be disciplined. And so prayer and fasting is a spiritual discipline that the Lord can use in my life. We are concluding our, our prayer uh, emphasis month today with a, a message simply entitled, Prayer That Ushers in Conversion. Prayer that ushers in conversion. Now, let's begin this morning by answering the question, what is conversion? Well, conversion is when a person comes face to face with Jesus, realizes what Jesus has done for them, receives Jesus completely and totally in their life, and Jesus then is seated on the throne of that person's life and becomes Lord and Savior for that person. That is conversion. When I am transformed, a great example for us is really Acts chapter 9. Uh, Saul is on the, ra on the road to Damascus, and Saul encounters who? Jesus. And Saul is never the same. He, has, he never is the same. He has a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. Jesus comes into his life, and he is changed. That's conversion. To be changed, to be converted, or to become a disciple of Jesus. Jesus. It's really coming to terms with these words that Jesus uses often, we see in the New Testament, follow me. Now, oftentimes what happens for us, and we talked about this a little bit last week, is there's this point in our lives where we receive Jesus, and then we're going through life, and now in front of me is two roads. The one road is my plan, what I'm going to do where I'm believing I need to go. And the other road is Jesus simply standing there beckoning me saying, follow me. And the difference between the two roads is, is that we can look down this road that is my plan, my idea, my direction, the things that I want to do, and we can kind of see what that's going to look like. But when we look at the other road, all we can see is Jesus. We can only see Jesus. And he's just saying, follow me. 
I got this. I know where we're going. Just follow me. I believe all of us at some point, at least one time in our life, but I believe probably multiple times in our lives, we come to that crossroads. We come to that crossroads. And we have to make a choice. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you must pick up your cross every day and follow me. Well, that's when we're looking down that road, and the only thing we can see is Jesus. He's the one that we're focused on. He's the one that we're moving into. That's conversion. Conversion is when a person comes to that place, and they learn to just follow the road that Jesus is on without knowing all the details. But by faith, trusting in Him, we're going to follow. We're going to follow Him. That is true. What I would suggest to you this morning would be true conversion. I believe we need to begin to pray for conversion. In our own lives, potentially, but in the lives of people around us, we need to begin to pray for conversion. It's been said that every pastor has about six sermons. Somebody say amen. And the truth is, that's really probably true. They may use different scriptures and they may use different things, but in essence, there's really just, for, for, for the most part, most pastors have between six and ten sermons that they preach. For you guys, you know that my heart is about evangelism. And eventually, no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I go, I will come back to evangelism. I will land somewhere around evangelism. Because I believe it's the very heart of God for His people to be reaching out to other people around us who don't know Jesus. It's what He asked us to do. He, what, it's what he commanded and commissioned us to do. And that's conversion. Every one of us have had someone come into our life, someone pray us into conversion. I know that after lots of research, I've had several people, several people that I've learned over time that uh, have prayed for me over the years. I had two uh, praying grandmothers, and I'm convinced that they prayed me into the kingdom. But they also modeled what that looks like in my life. So today I want you to get a hold of the idea of conversion, evangelism, us being involved in the concept of praying, or the kind of prayer that begins to usher in conversion, or begins to bring create a pathway or a road that allows people to begin to come down the road towards Jesus, or prayer that leads for conversion. Now, oftentimes, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but many times we go into our prayer closets, we go into our prayer time, and usually what happens for us is we have a list of things that we're wanting Jesus to do in our life. If you agree with that, just nod your head. We have our laundry list. Well, our laundry list is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. We're, we have things that we need Jesus to speak into our life about. We need Jesus to minister to us. And many times we, we leave out what are, where I really want to go today. Reminding us of people that we need to be praying for. Family members. And taking some time to pray for that person or persons. Uh, this morning, little Peyton, you know, the, the gospel that Jesus died for my sin. That's the gospel that we should be sharing, we should be speaking into. It begins for us in prayer. 
So I invite you to open your hearts this morning to the Holy Spirit. We're going to dive quickly in here. We're going to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ezekiel chapter 3. We're going to look at a couple of sets of scriptures here where the Lord is speaking to the prophet Ezekiel. Chapter 3, starting in verse 16. Again, this is the Lord speaking to Ezekiel. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. This is Ezekiel writing about himself. Son of man, I have made you a watchman over the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die. And you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him for his evil ways in order to save his life. That wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. I entitled this section, Ezekiel's Challenge for the Wicked. Can somebody say amen to that? Imagine you're sitting in Ezekiel's chair that day. Ezekiel has been commanded by the Lord to speak to the wicked people in the people of Israel. Or to the unrighteous, the unholy, those people in the nation of Israel who are not following God. They have abandoned the Lord God. They have turned away from the Lord God. And they are living in wickedness. They are living in the ways of the world. And the challenge for Ezekiel was that His responsibility, the Lord has put the responsibility upon him to speak to them and to try to dissuade them from their wicked ways. And he even calls it sin. He challenges Ezekiel to go into the nation of Israel and begin to speak to the nation of Israel especially those who are not following the Lord, and try to convert them back to God. And then he says to to Israel, if you don't do that, if you choose to not do that, and that person dies in his sin, and you have not attempted, at least attempted, By speaking to that person, then I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do, and he rejects you, and he dies in his sin, his blood will be on his own head. Now, how many of you want to sit in Ezekiel's chair? So Ezekiel's first challenge was simply to speak to the people who were not following the Lord. Secondly, Ezekiel's challenge was to speak to the righteous. Picking up in verse 20. When a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before him, he will die. Since you did not warn him, he will die for his sin. The righteous things he did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you warn the righteous man not to sin, and he does not sin, he will surely live because he took warning, and you will have saved yourself." Now the Lord takes it to a whole nother place. 
Not only is Ezekiel being challenged to speak to the people of Israel who are not following the Lord, but he's also being challenged to speak to the people of Israel who are following the Lord and who are following the Lord in a way that is not fully and completely the way God would ask them to do it. And those people are in danger of dying outside the Lord. They are in danger of missing those things. And Ezekiel has challenged to speak to the people of Israel who are, quote, following the Lord and to warn them and to make sure that those people are staying where they're supposed to be. And he says, again, if you do not and they die, I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do and they die, you will have saved yourself. Evangelism. We are a body of believers. We are people who are following Christ. We are looking at the Lord. The Lord is challenging us to follow Him. If we are following Christ, then we are Ezekiel for today. We are the Ezekiels of the modern day. Now, I don't know whether the Lord attaches the same level of accountability to us that He does Ezekiel, but it's obviously clear that the Lord takes this rather seriously. This is not a flippant subject for the Lord. The Lord takes evangelism or the sharing of the gospel with those who are straying away from Him and with those who are supposedly following Him very seriously. We have taken the concept of evangelism in our culture today and so minimized it by attaching it to a few people who are supposedly gifted for evangelism. But is it not, could it not, is it maybe, to some degree, to some level, every believer's responsibility? To be able to speak to people in a way that brings them closer to Christ that ushers in something different in their life, that reveals to them revelation of who Jesus is. I'm not saying this morning that each one of us here are under this same responsibility that the Lord put upon Ezekiel. That's not what I'm saying. But I will say to you this. It seems to me as I read the Word, and actually there's a whole other section just a few chapters over in the, in the book of Ezekiel again. It seems to me that the Lord is very concerned for the people who are not following Him. And He's very concerned for the people who say they're following Him but aren't really. And where does that take us? I believe it takes us to prayer. It takes us to a place where we learn to begin to pray in a way that ushers in conversion.
And it's not that we shouldn't have our list of things that we, we need the Lord to do in our life. That's not what I'm saying. It's a way of entering in where we are going to not only do that, but we're going to pray into conversion. And making myself usable for conversion. How do we do that? Well, I want to start this morning with really two things. The first, really, there's just two things this morning. The first one is spirit-led prayer. Say that with me, spirit-led prayer. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Say that again, spirit-led prayer. Starting in verse 1. Reading through first verse 4, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house while they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Spirit-led prayer is when I allow the Spirit of God to begin to flow into me in a way where I begin to pray in a way that I wouldn't normally pray. Or I begin to pray for people I wouldn't normally pray for. I begin to pray into things I wouldn't normally pray for. I begin to be led through the Spirit of God in my prayer life that begins to open up doors for prayer that I haven't yet engaged, I haven't yet gone to. Paul tells us to pray in the Spirit on all occasions. On all occasions. So that means I need to allow the Spirit access to my prayer life. I need to be able to open my life so that the Spirit begins to come in through me and I begin to pray in accordance with the Spirit. Why would I want to pray in accordance with the Spirit? Because the Spirit is coming to me directly from the throne room of God. And the Spirit knows the will of the Father. And He's wanting to use me, speak through me, to begin to pray in ways I have yet to pray, for people I have yet to pray for, begin to intercede through the Spirit, begin to lift up things through the Spirit. Say this with me. That is more than my laundry list. For that to happen, I have to be open. I have to be willing. I also have to create the time. For that to take place. I'm not going to be led by the Spirit in prayer if only I'm spending five minutes. Or I'm driving down the road and I'm thinking about 25,000 other things and trying to pray at the same time. Or my phone is going off. Or my computer is going off. Or my television is on. There's a place for me as a believer being a follower of Christ where the Holy Spirit baptizes me into a whole nother prayer life. That is far deeper than and far power, more powerful than anything I can do in my own flesh. And as I begin to pray in the Spirit, led by the Spirit, I begin to pray in ways that I am not going to be able to pray just in my flesh. My flesh begins to die, and then the Spirit begins to speak and pray through me. He 
He begins to tell me people that I should be praying for. He begins to lead me in directions about prayer. He begins to ask me to pray about this or to pray about that or to pray into this or pray into that or intercede here, intercede there. I have to be open. He will begin to place in my heart people who are not following Jesus and He will begin to ask me to intercede for them. So that they can be converted. They can come to know Jesus. If you are a leader in this church in any form, I want to I would beg you today to begin to pray in your spirit. Begin to create a space in your life where the Spirit begins to work through you in your prayer life. Where He begins to speak through you. What is a result of Spirit-led prayer? We can skip all the way down to verse 41. We all know that Peter, uh, the, all the disciples go out into the out into the streets, they begin to preach the gospel. They're preaching the gospel in languages that people around them can understand. They're not just out there babbling. They're not just out there saying whatever. They're actually preaching in languages that people all around them can understand. And we know that many of those people, because of the scripture we're about to read, were converted they were converted. Verse 40, 41 says, Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Say with me, 3,000. 3,000 is 80% of the people who live in Palmyra, Missouri. Three thousand. After spirit-led prayer, after Peter and the other disciples taking on the challenge to go out into the street to warn both the wicked and the righteous about the Lord, about what was going on in their lives, 3,000 in one day were converted, baptized, and became followers of Jesus. as they took on the challenge of looking around, as they were led by the Spirit, something amazing happened. Lastly this morning, the second part is unified prayer. Staying in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. Should be right there. They devoted themselves. This is the followers of Christ. Those 3,000 people plus the 120 that were, so were somewhere around 3,120 people. This 3,120 people devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. What were they devoted to after being converted? Teaching, fellowshipping, the sharing of the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. They were unified in prayer. They were consistent in prayer. They were together in prayer. They were praying about the same things. There was something powerful taking place. So powerful that it says in verse 47, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
So powerful was their commitment to prayer, to fellowship, to being together, to be unified, that the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved or those who were being converted. They were having baptism services every day. They were training people every day. They were going out into the street every day and taking on Ezekiel's challenge and speaking the gospel to the people around them, both those both who were struggling to find the Lord and those who were in the Lord. We see clearly in the New Testament that not only did the New Testament church speak to the people who were not in the church, but they was clearly they were speaking to the people who were, quote, in the church. Paul spent hours upon hours, trips upon trips, trying to reach out to the Jews, the righteous, who were not really seeing the whole message. They were missing Jesus. And he was trying to convert them to see Jesus. See, Ezekiel's challenge is covered throughout Scripture. Evangelism, prayer that ushers in conversion. Prayer. My prayer matters. Say that with me. My prayer matters. Do you believe that? Do you believe that your prayer could matter for somebody else? Could usher in a whole different framework. Do you believe that your prayer would matter for Palmyra, Missouri? Or Marion County? or the state of Missouri, or wherever. Being led in prayer through the Spirit of God, being unified in prayer together. One of the reasons we do prayer and fasting is that we want to try to unify us in prayer. To encourage all of us to be involved in some way. In prayer. It's a powerful thing when God's people pray. Really pray. My greatest healing, my greatest personal healing comes from my prayer. From my time with the Lord. That's where I get healed every day. I get renewed every day. As I spend time with the Lord, He changes my life. He brings healing. He brings restoration. He brings freedom. He brings grace. He brings mercy. He brings forgiveness. He brings love when I pray. And prayer is not a quick five-minute Okay, Jesus, I need you to do this and this and this and this and this and this today. Thanks. Bye. That's not prayer. Prayer is, Lord, I need you to do those things. Now, what do you want me to do? See, most of us leave off the, now what do you want me to do part. We don't spend any time listening. We don't spend any time really hearing. The Spirit's trying to work, and we're, we're, we got, well, I got to get to work, but I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to do this, got to do that, got to do this, got to do this. Have you ever noticed that busyness kills your spiritual life? Have you ever noticed how 
the busier you get, the farther away from God you get. And then you wake up one day and you think, man, what's going on? Why is everything so stinky? Why am I having such a terrible day? Why is my family doing what they're doing? Why is all this happening? Oh, well, I guess I really haven't talked to God for the last 90 days. I haven't really even spent any time with Him. I haven't opened the Bible. I haven't really spent any quality time with God. Prayer changes everything. Prayer ushers in the opportunity for conversion. Spirit-led prayer, unified prayer. Both fronts. My challenge for you in 2015 is don't let January be your prayer emphasis month, and not pray any more for the rest of the year. Keep praying. Don't stop. Would you see the days of prayer and fasting coming up? Do it. Engage it. Commit to it. Be disciplined about it. Be disciplined about it. Just say yes to it. Open your heart to allow the Spirit of God to begin to change your prayer life from the inside of you out. Let the Spirit of God begin to change you in your spiritual life, in your prayer life. Let your prayers begin to take on what the Spirit of God wants them to be, not what you want them to be. Get unified with somebody. Get in your cell groups, in your cell groups. Get unified in prayer for the lost, for the hurting, for the wounded, for the wicked, for the righteous. Get unified in prayer with somebody, at least one other person. Find at least one other person to be unified in prayer with. Get together. Make prayer a priority in our cell groups. Make prayer a priority in our ministries. And then watch as the Lord begins adding to their number daily. And then watch as the Lord gives you opportunity to be Ezekiel and to share with a, a wicked person or even to share with a righteous person about Jesus. Not about religion, about Jesus. About Jesus. As the worship team comes this morning, I'm going to invite you to stand up here this morning. And we're going to enter into just a short season here today of Spirit-led prayer. Now, you may be a little uncomfortable with that, and I'm not trying to uh, point you out or draw you out or try to get you to do something you don't want to do. It's not what I'm trying to do. We're going to take a couple minutes here this morning, and we're going to allow the Spirit of God to begin to move, and we're just going to pray as the Spirit begins to move for you. you just, you're just going to pray in accordance with the Spirit. Now you may think to yourself, well, I've never really done that. Well, let me help you. Put your eyes on Jesus. Put your eyes on the cross. Shut everything else down. Everything else goes away. Everything else disappears. My whole focus is on the cross of Christ. And then just say, Lord, send me your spirit. 
I want to pray today. I just want to pray in accordance with your spirit and with your will. <coughs> That's all you have to do. There's not some magic words or some magic thing that goes on. I just put my focus, all of my focus goes on Jesus. On the cross. Not on me. On Jesus. And then just invite him to begin to show you what he, how to pray. And then just start praying. Just start, just let your mouth just start to pray. Just start praying. You don't have to pray loud. Just begin to pray. Just let it come out. Let it come out. Just let it flow. Take your brain out. Turn your brain off. Turn all your busyness off. Turn your cell phone off, your computer off. If that casserole you got in the oven burns up, it burns up. <laughs> Turn everything off. Just to put your eyes on Jesus and let Him lead you. Let Him show you how to pray. And then when we get done, we're just going to have a unified prayer. We're just going to come into agreement. We're going to be unified on some things this morning. I'm going to lead us through that when we get done. So I'm going to pray here, and I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to come, and I'm going to invite you to simply raise your hands to the Lord, close your eyes, put your eyes upon Jesus, and just let Him show you what to pray. All you guys on the worship team, don't, if you need to just do whatever you got to do. If we don't have any music, we don't have music. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that you have showed us prayer. Prayer through the Spirit of God as you would lead us. Lord, give us the courage here this morning to engage prayer through your Spirit, that your Spirit would begin to lead us in prayer, begin to open our hearts to you. Lord, give us a vision so that we can really accept your Spirit running through us. And then, Lord, as we go to unified prayer, I pray that you would just hear our hearts, encourage us, and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you now just to begin to pray. Put your focus on Jesus. Just let His Spirit begin to flow.